Okay, and in this week's podcast episode, we're titling this one, Know Your Number, The Fundamentals of Business Valuation. And I'm thrilled to introduce Gus Perez, partner of National Leader Valuation Services for Cherry Beckett for the past 13 plus years. Prior to Cherry Beckett, he was a partner at Berenfield, Spritzer, Schlechter, and Scheer. Gus has also held positions in litigation support and business valuation for Morrison, Brown, Argees, and Ferrer, which is now BDO, and Rackling, Cohen, and Holtz, which is now Markham. This is fantastic. Gus, thank you for being on the show. We have known each other for, what, 15 years now, probably? I've at least. You, at least. I, you and your service on some of our assignments, and I have nothing but great things to say about you and your team, Gus. Well done. Fabulous, fabulous service in terms of valuation support, impairments, and so on, particularly I have hired you for early stage companies, right? And those mid-sized ones. So really nicely done, Cass. Happy to have you here. Hey, thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. So, you know, always good to be, you know, to see you and, and chatting with you. Awesome, Gus. All right. So let's kick it off. Introduction to valuation and the fundamental valuation techniques, Gus. What are the fundamental principles that business leaders need to understand about valuing a business? Well, I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of information that people talk about when, you know, when it comes to business valuation. And, and you know, I'll say the, the principle of business valuation is return on investment, right? So, you know, when, when somebody looks at a business, they're just looking at another investment. Um, just like you would be talking about, you know, buying gold or buying a vehicle or buying a house. A business is another investment. So what is going to be the return on investment that am I going to be able to get out of this business? And how do you calculate that, right? So... That creates value for some people, and you know that value will be reflected on that return on investment. So getting to know that, I think, is going to be critical. And and I know we're going to get a little deeper into you know some of the theory, but you know that that's the key: return on investment when it comes to you know value in businesses. Got it. All right, Gus. So how important is it to know your number? I think it's it's really important. You know, privately held businesses are known as the public trading companies that have their trading stocks in the in the stock market that they can see, you know, how these stocks are, you know, moving up and down in a daily basis, weekly, quarterly, whatever. You don't really have a sense of how your business is moving unless you have some sense of, you know, the value of your business. And so having a knowledge of, of, of that will be critical for a lot of different purposes. Again, you know, business is definitely a private, especially private health companies are long-term investments that, you know, people make. It could be your first business that you Created from star, you know, back in your in the garage, and then you grew it to, you know, what it is. For, for example, today Amazon or some of these other businesses, but eventually you're going to try to monetize this. You're going to try to somehow get some liquidity out of these businesses, all the sweat equity that you've been putting in, and everything that you've done. And so, having an understanding of, you know, what this business is worth and what is your value, and you know, staying on top of your numbers will be critical. And that will help you to also find ways to continue increasing the value of the business. So understanding the value and understanding those factors that help you to increase value will be very important. Absolutely. We're going we're gonna to go deep into those, Gus, for sure, right? So, so Gus, just as a, as a kind of preface, what are valuations used for typically in business? There's a lot of usage. As a matter of fact, you know, when people talk about valuation, they, somebody calls me and say, I need a valuation. The first thing I ask is, what do you need it for? And the reason for that is in trying to understand the definition of what value is. Um, you know, you'll be surprised. You know, it seems like fairly easy. You know, value is value, but it's not really value it doesn't mean value. When you talked about IRS valuation, for example, you're dealing with a state, you know, return and you have to file taxes. The definition of value for the IRS is different than the definition of value, for example, for financial reporting. If you're, you know, filing your, you know, um, audit financial statements. So there's a, there's a definition for what fair value means. There's a definition for fair market value under IRS. There's a different definition for, you know, what we call investment value, you know, transaction value, what, you know, potential, uh, what I consider to be an investment banker value would look like, right? So there is a lot of different definitions. You have a minority interest, you have a controlling interest. So there's a lot of things that people need to understand and that's why, you know, when you go back and trying to figure out what is the valuation used for, um, it is critical to understand that purpose so that you can come up with the right definition. So what we do is valuations or what we do for when it comes to valuation is primarily 
in our practice, we do merge and acquisition. So we help clients in the sell side, buy side to understand what their businesses are worth. Just so that, you know, they start getting a sense of if they decide to get some liquidity out of the business, some chips out of the table, that's how we call it. Hey, you know, here's what we think your business is worth and here's what you need to do to improve the value. Um, if you're filing, you know, if you're doing an estate planning, like right now, what is happening with a, you know, potential tax exclusion, you know, the tax limitation, you have about, you know, 13 point something million dollars in tax limit, um, exclusions when it comes to, you know, the state planning. Um, that might sunset next year. So we're getting a lot of volume when it comes to estate planning work. People taking advantage of that today. Well, you got to know that, you know, that is on the fair market value. That's a different purpose of what we do in it. Um, you know, we also do it for, you know, what we call financial reporting. It could be, you know, um, part of your purchase price allocation. Um, you know, if you're issuing options to your employees or you're doing anything related to fair value, there's different definitions for that. So there's a lot of different purposes as to why or how these valuations are being used. And it's important that you have a good understanding so that you don't necessarily utilize a valuation that could have been done in your company maybe a year ago for a, let's say, stock compensation um, and trying to say, well, that's my value if I sell the business. No, absolutely not. That's on a minority basis. There might be discount associated with those valuations. Where in a controlling basis, if you're selling 100% of your business, maybe some of the discounts are not applicable and so on. So just make sure that you understand that and you know, don't try to piggyback in one valuation that was used for one purposes versus another valuation for a different purpose. I will say that's that's really, really important. And typically I come across that richer more often than not. And um, where you know I do have clients saying, Well, listen, you know, I need this for the IRS, but I just issue, you know, these for my auditors. I just want to go ahead and do that. Well, don't do that. The IRS will basically go back and say, that's not the purpose. You know, if you do that for charitable contribution, the IRS most likely will take this and say, sorry, we're not going to take your valuation and therefore we're not going to qualify you as a charitable contribution donation and, and the purposes of, you know, this exercise. So, just be aware of what you're doing, you know, work with your professionals, your law firms, you know, your advisors, you know, tax advisors, you know, valuation and so on, so that you understand, you know, how and, and when to use the specific valuations um, that are being provided to you. I love that, Gus. Thank you. That's a really important point because I've seen that so many times. Yes. Oh, we spent all this outside money to value whatever, whether it's, you know, for an impairment or value of the business. Why can't we use it for X, Y, Z? If we can, without going too deep on this point, Gus, um, let's do a quick illustration. Just let's take three things. Uh, you know, yes. an owner wants to sell a business um, or an owner has an estate IRS planning matter or for financial reporting. Just how would you, without too complicated, how would you define value in each of those in each of those areas? Just, just those three ones, if we picked on those to start with. Absolutely. So I'll tell you the way the IRS define value is, is uh, you know, fair market value is, is a hypothetical value from a hypothetical, what we call willing buyer and a willing seller, right? So so a lot of times when we do valuation work for estate planning, for example, you know, what we're being asked to do is to value minority interest in a company. So let's say, hey, I need to value 10% of my company because that's what I'm going to be maybe gifting or transferring into a trust as a strategy. Um, and so when you do that, the understanding of being a privately held company, you need to take into consideration discount for lack of liquidity as well as discount for lack of control potentially, right? So you, you're kind of somehow reducing the value of that 10%. So if you're saying the business was worth $10 million, 10% is no a million. 10% now turn out to be 700,000 because you took into consideration those discounts. However, if you go back and say, okay, now I want evaluation for purposes of selling my business, then there's a different exercise that you're doing controlling interest. And on top of that, you want to take into consideration factors related to, you know, synergies, for example. You know, what is the most likely scenario? Who are you going to sell to? You know, we're talking about what type of strategic buyers, financial buyers. Are we dealing, you know, with financial buyers and, you know, PE groups? Or are we dealing with a strategic buyer? Um, if we are a strategic buyers, there are going to be some synergies, some specific, you know, advantage when it comes to maybe cost reductions, or, you know, some increase in, in, in revenue due to maybe new services that we'd be providing to, you know, a customer base that we didn't have. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that you can consider when you're doing that for an, you know, M&A transaction. 
if you're doing it for financial reporting, then each one is different, right? So you're doing it for an impairment test, for example. I mean, the definition of fair value is also different than the definition of fair market value, which is more related to market participants. So you have to take into consideration market participants. There's no hypothetical buyer or seller. In this case, we will know the buyer and seller. And with the way that the fair value, you know, the accountants under US GAAP define fair value is also more an exit point of view, which is what is the value upon, you know, exiting the business where some of the other valuations would be more entry values and so on. So there's there's a lot of definitions and those definition will boil down, like the way I look at the definitions, they will have an impact on the underlying valuation of the business. So the value for the same business for, for different purposes will be different. Understood. Does that make sense? I mean, you'll have a different value under different purpose, under different definition. Understood. So is valuation art or science? <laughs> yeah, you. I'm sure you heard that. I'll say everybody talks about being an art, and I would agree with that as well, but there's definitely a lot of science behind that too. So, um, you know, a lot of times things got to make sense. So you can just go by the science because a lot of times you can crunch numbers as much as you can and then come up with a come up with a conclusion of value doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? And so what I always tell a lot of my people and financial analysts are getting into this, you know, new is that, yep, start with the science and, you know, do the crunch of the work, you know, make sure that you get everything done correctly based on, you know, the understanding of the theory. But then when you look at it, you got to make sure that this makes sense. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of a mix. Okay. All right. And so when, um, when the heat starts and there's a, let's say there's a, a transaction, there's a sale transaction of a business. All right. And I'm a willing buyer and you're a willing seller. All right. What does it really come down to then, Gus? We can crunch the numbers. We can have some parameters and some frameworks and bookends around valuation. When in the heat of the moment, what does it really come down to? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, Richard, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, you just come down to that negotiation point, right? I mean, you know, I will say that you're never going to find an evaluation that will end up exactly the same transaction price, unless that was, you know, a legal, you know, situation where you actually have a, you know, a litigation case where, you know, the judge will go by your number and that's it. That's the number. But, you know, typically when it comes to valuation, even investment bankers or any, anything out there that, you know, anybody that professionals that do this work, they know better that, this is a range of value. And, you know, sometimes we'll give our clients a range and say, here's where we think your business should be worth. And that's the range, right? That's based on all the metrics, all the data that we get, you know, from the economy, the industry, the market comparables. I mean, there's a lot of information that we rely to come up with those numbers. But you will have situations where, you know, a buyer might offer a number that turned out to be a lot greater than that range. And you know, there's a lot of factors why, you know, that happens. I mean, it could be that, you know, the buyer needs this company. It is a must to have it. And they're willing to pay above and beyond what this company standing alone will produce. In other words, this company will be worth a lot more under the umbrella of the buyer than the company standing alone. And so, yeah, when we do this valuation, that's what we're trying to explain it. We're trying to take into consideration all those factors, but you never know. Once you put these companies for sale and you get into the auction process, you know, you'll never know what the numbers are going to come up to be. I mean, a lot of times they're coming between those range, but sometimes they're outside the range. And, you know, hopefully it will be above what, you know, the potential seller was expecting to get. But I always tell, you know, my clients when they do this exercise is at least to start with the fundamental number of what we think the business is worth. That's the fundamental. Anything above that, I will say is great. And that's great. Um, and then it's up to you to decide how much are you willing to, to accept. If somebody come up with a number that's less than what my range is, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It's just that you were in a specific situation that you felt it's time to move on and I'm willing to sell for less than what the fundamental number is. Um, the same as, you know, potential buyer offering above and beyond what this, you know, business is standing along will be worth. So it just boiled down to that moment, you know, what, what the final negotiation is. And, you know, when you go out and trying to get a value for your business in the form of an auction situation where you know investment bankers put companies for sale. 
typically the banker and, and the professionals will basically have a range and idea what your business is worth before you go out into the market. Because that's, that's the number one thing that you need to do first. But once you do that, then you let the market decide. You're not going out there saying, here's the value of the company. Who wants to buy me for this value? Because that would be already indicating. It's like playing poker and showing you cards, right? It's like you want to let the potential interested parties to come back and tell you what they're willing to pay for your business. If they're less than what I was expecting to get, then I don't take those offers. That's the case, right? I can wait and see what happens. If there are more, then great. Maybe you take those offers. Um, and that's what happened. It's just very similar to the stock market. If you were to look at the stock market today, you know, some shares will go up and down. They started going up, they go down, they go up and they go. Does that mean that they're inefficient? No, but it's telling you that every day, public trade and privately held markets are trying to find out where they're worth. You know, tomorrow the market can tank. It's like, well, what happened? Did we make a mistake last, last afternoon? Didn't we know what was going on? So every time you get new information, things will change. And the same thing goes with privately held companies. So, you know, when you value a company, as what I always say, it's, it's going to be eventually a range of value, really, if you're thinking about selling your business or buying another business. Now, when it comes to hmm, what we call compliance work, you have to come up with one number. You yeah. cannot just keep the IRS a range or you cannot just keep the auditors a range and say, here's the range of value. They want to have one value. Um, and so... That's sometimes the challenge is just part of the reporting, but, you know, uh, requirements. But, you know, when it comes to consulting, you get a range of value, high, low. Here's what the expectations are. And and those numbers will, those ranges will be changing as we move forward, um, you know, based on a lot of different factors. Some of those, some of those factors will be company related. Um, and some of those other factors will be industry or economy related. And so, wow. you know, some yeah, no, absolutely. No, this is brilliant. I love this. I love this conversation. So, um, Gus, in your over twenty years of, of doing this, how do you set expectations? Let's let, let's let's hit let's hit the the points again about an entrepreneur looking to sell his business, which is a life changing event. You know, the seller is going to think uh, you know valuations you know too low, and the buyer is going to think it's too high. How, in your you know quarter of a century plus experience? Do you set expectations with either side? Because there's got to be challenges. You're crunching numbers. You've got, you know, a model, et cetera. But you, you're going to hit the challenges in terms of mindset. How do you set expectations, Gus? Yeah, and that's a great point, Richard. I mean, you know, in accounting, you got debits and credits. And then yes. if something doesn't go the way that's supposed to go, then you just go by the books, right? And say, well, here's what the book says. This is what US CAP says, and this is what you got to do. Sorry. You got to book this as a liability or an asset or whatever it is. That's how it works. In valuation, you don't necessarily have that. You know, values could be high, low. I don't know what what the clients are expecting. So um, what I typically do, you know, I basically tell them, you hire me to be the objective expert. Number yes. one. Um, if you want me to tell you that your number is right and that's what you're hiring me for, then let, I know your guy. Because then, you know, it's like going to the doctor and telling the doctor, don't test me. I'm perfectly fine. And I need you to write a report saying I'm perfectly fine. You don't need to do anything to me. And so the doctor will be like, well, that's that's fine. But that, you know, I'm not serving you anything good. You know, I'm not doing anything for you. So I just tell clients and say, just let me do my job. And then I'll come back and we'll discuss my conclusion of value. And I'll be ready to get into, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it debate, but I'll, I'll be more than happy to go into the very details as to how I'll come up with my value. And then you can chime in and challenge my numbers and we'll have discussions about, um, you know, I'm not stubborn and I'm humble. And, you know, if I do find something that maybe I could have missed on it and then, they are, you know, if I'm a client that's right, hey, I'll, I'll be happy to revisit, you know, but, but at the end of the day, you, you do your homework um, and, you know, this, this process is not a process that you just get the data, you stay away from the client, never talk to the client again and come back and say, voila, here's my number. There's going to be a management interview. There's going to be a lot of assessment of past performance versus just future expectations. You know, there's going to be a lot of good understanding of the market, your competitors, you know, prior transactions um, in this industry. You know, there's a lot of things you're going to be looking into it that when you finally narrow everything down and keeping management, your client, you know, informed about your process and what you're trying to do, and how you're doing it, they're starting to understand where you're coming from. They're going to start agreeing with you. It's like, okay, I get it. 
And then it's no surprising. A lot of times when I come up with this number, it's like, no surprise. They might say, yeah, the number turned out to be a lot less or a lot more than what I was suspecting. Yeah, I thought my business was worth a lot more based on a you know cocktail party. Somebody told me, you know, this is a these companies are sold based on multiples of X, Y, and Z. And but that was a cocktail party. But now I got to work with you for you know three plus weeks, you know, three, four, five weeks. You know, we have a lot of discussions throughout the whole process. I see where you're coming from and you support your your information and, and conclusion of value. And you know. That's the best way to present it. And, you know, at that point, you know, I think when, when it comes to expectations, you know, they, they just expect you to do the work, the work. Got it. I don't think the expectation is about what the number is more about. Did you do the homework? Did you do the work? Did you miss something? Did you take into consideration what I told you that was important that, you know, there's, there's stuff that, you know, we're going to have a new contract next year. We got this going on and we, you know, we have one time laws that needed to be adjusted and that should have been included in my, you know, overall analysis. Did you take all those factors into consideration, right? And so that's our work to make sure that in a very brief time frame, like, you know, it could be a few weeks, we need to really learn as much as we can about these pieces. Maybe we have a really good experience about the industry, but each business is different, Richard. And, you know, our clients have been with these businesses, of, you know, for years, 20, 40, 50 years. I mean, you name it. And so, Having an outsider to come in and trying to understand the business as much as they do is you not know, something that, you know, uh, makes a lot of sense for them. You're just trying to understand as much, absorb as much as you can so that you can utilize these data and combine that with all your knowledge about, you know, finance, valuation, economy, accounting, everything else, put it into a package and then be able to support it in front of your client, the board, you know, potential buyer, potential seller. The judge, the IRS, the auditors, you name it. Everybody will be questioning you the whole time. So we're used to that. Absolutely. Well said. Okay. Art and science. So let's 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 go down a bit deeper now. Um, Gus, can you provide an overview of the different valuation methods available for businesses? Yeah. So um, so in theory, we have really three main valuation methods, right? So one, we call it the income approach. The other one is the asset approach and the other one is the as, um, the market approach. So the income approach goes back to what I just mentioned originally in the, in the discussion that we have related to return on investment. So it's basically, you know, what is the what is the expected cash flows are gonna generate out of these pieces and what is my expected rate of return? So when you put those two together, um, you actually come up with what we call value because this is you have future income a discount rate which is the rate of return and then you got the present value so it's a very i'm trying to simplify this as much as i can but that's oh, that's basically the income approach yes the other one the other one i call it the market approach <clears throat> which is very similar to what you will do when you sell your home you look at your neighbor's house that you sold two days ago it was exactly as your house and they sold for x y and z um Square footage, you know, ten dollars per square foot, a hundred, two hundred, whatever. You apply that to your house, you're like, voila, I got my house value. But then you'll say, my house got a brand new kitchen, I got to be in here, I got all these new things, I got the the new windows, I got everything in my new house. Therefore, it should be worth more than the other one, and you make an adjustment. Exactly with businesses, right? So we look at both publicly traded companies as well as privately held companies. And so, on the publicly traded companies that are in the same industry, we'll come up with you know some of these multiples that we talk about, you know. It could be a multiple revenue, multiple operating income. We call it, you know, EB that, which is earning before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. Um, you know, it could be multiples of earnings and so on. And then you use that multiple adjusted to take into consideration your businesses, your business factors. It could be growth, you know, um, that you've been achieving, expect to achieve going forward compared to the companies that you're looking into. It could be size adjusted. There's a lot of factors. You adjust that multiple, then boom, apply to yours. And voila, you got a business value. Um, and then you also do look into mergers and acquisitions. So we'll have access to, you know, based on our environment, based on what we do, we have what we call, you know, private transaction data that we kind of keep in our um, databases after, you know, different industries, what, you know, some of these companies are trading for. Um, and they could be, you know, they're most likely privately held. Because we work with you know 400 plus different PE groups, and so we have a sense. Um, 
this this all this all data is is kind of confidential, so we don't share the, the back of where it is coming from, but it's just having a good sense of where they're coming. But there's also different databases that you can subscribe to. And we have subscription to many of them that will publish information about privately held companies and, and the transactions that took place. So you can utilize some of those databases and then develop a multiple or you know merges and acquisitions that took place of you know similar companies to yours and then apply those multiples to your company. And then the last one is what we call the asset approach, which is more of a looking at your company assets and liability and coming up with the value of the company almost in a kind of, a, you know, um, I will say goodwill, intangible value exclusion. Because, you know, you, you'll sometimes have companies that are very heavy on equipment and machinery and so on, or real estate holding companies that, you know, a lot of times the value that you're going to come up with some of these companies is just the value of the underlying assets. So if it's a real estate holding company, that on say a piece of real estate, well, once you come up with the value of the real estate, you put it at a fair value in the balance sheet, subtract the mortgage, you get to the equity. That's typically what you're gonna do, right? Um, the value of the real estate most likely already taken into consideration some sort of income approach or everything else, as well as market data. But when you value the business and sell, you're not doing it again. I mean, you're just basically utilizing that asset approach. Um, and so those are the three different methodologies that we typically see. Um, and, and the most common, and I think that the ones that I'm aware of. Got it. And so what about early stage companies, Gus? What about the ones who <clears throat> don't have a track record of earnings or revenue perhaps, or, or, you know, material assets or anything like that, or I may have an idea, I may have IP. How would you go about valuing those, Gus? And I want yeah, seed capital, let's say, I want seed capital or early rounds, et cetera. How would you go about doing that? Yeah, those are <clears throat> very challenging and, and to your point. So so let's say you don't you have an early stage company that have no raised capital and they're trying to figure out what this company is worth. So, you know, the, the challenge is you, you gotta have a sense of what where is this company going to, right? So there's not gonna be a lot of past performance because there is just maybe developing technology or developing, you know, systems, you know, there's they're in the development process. So maybe they need capital to continue, you know, getting through the whole process of putting all the together so that they can eventually um, somehow commercialize their products, right? So that's the key. Um, so what we typically work around is trying to come up with some sort of forecast projections, right? So trying to understand, if I'm an investor, I need to know how much longer do I need to continue financing this company? Um, what are the probabilities that this company is going to eventually be successful in developing this technology or drug or whatever it is that they're doing? And, and then number three, what is my return on investment? What, what am I expecting to get out of that? Because if I'm going to put a million dollars um, and all I'm going to get is 10% on this, I might better off just investing in the public or traded companies. You know, they're already established, they're already producing income. If that's the type of return on investment I'm getting from those guys. So we need to get those three factors. But yeah, the challenge is getting to somehow understand what is going to look like um, in the future if once a company commercializes these products or whatever it is that they're developing and how much cash flows this, this company is going to be able to generate one, two, three, four, five years down the road, whenever it is that it's going to happen. Um, how am I going to, liquidate my position if this is going to be something I'll do before the company successfully, you know, commercialize the product or after. So there's all these factors that, that are being taken into consideration. So when we be when we are getting asked to do these valuations, we work very closely with management to understand the stage of development. You know, at what stage are we? Are we, you know, in the in the in the beta testing or are we, you know, on the level one, two to three of development? I mean, are we almost ready to go out into the market. I mean, where are we? Do we have patents? Are we? Do we have anything that protects this, this technology, the know-how, whatever that we have in place? Um, you know, do we have the financial resources? How are we going to get it? Because that's the other challenge. If we don't get financial resources and we have great ideas, I've seen many businesses going out of business. I've seen so many great ideas, Richard, that you don't have. I mean, it's unbelievable, but I've seen unbelievably great ideas that they couldn't get it to the next level because they run out of cash or because sometimes the industries will shut them down. I mean, I've seen situations where this will be kind of 
you know, I will say the disruptive technology that will change so many things that some of the large players will say, no, 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 no. We don't want that. That's going to have a negative impact on our business. We'll buy those guys now and they'll take them out of business. You know, they buy them, get the technology and then put this back in the shelf. So it's not saying that there's no value in the technology, but it's like, what do you think Coke will do if they buy Pepsi? The first thing they'll do, they take Pepsi's name out of the, you know, out of the market. And so Pepsi disappeared. It doesn't mean Pepsi doesn't have any value. But, you know, we've seen situations like that. And so for us, it's really trying to understand, you know, what is the, you know, what is the plan? What is the future looking like? How long is it going to take us together? And then take into consideration all those risk factors to develop a required rate return to bring those cash flows back to present value. And sometimes we take, you know, into consideration what we call, um, you know, probability, probability weighting scenario. So, you know, here's your best scenario. Here's my low scenario. Here's what we really expect to happen. And then start working around some of those. We get sophisticated as to building even simulations. We use sometimes Monte Carlo simulation to run some of these scenarios and trying to see, you know, um, what we end up with when it comes to, you know, some of these um, scenarios. Let's keep it can be It can be very, it can be very challenging. Now, going back to your question. So let's say there's now a company that's an early stage, but they did a round of financing. Then that helps a lot from the perspective of understanding, okay, you now you finally went through the path of raising capital. Somebody was willing to pay X, Y, and Z for the company. So we can utilize that as, as part of what we call the calibration method. So, you know, we, we try to understand a lot of time people will tell us, well, we raise capital. We end up selling X many shares for this much, do many dollars. We don't have a, an understanding how that number came up. You know, sometimes they, they don't know. It's like, they just offered these and we took it. We need it. Um, and so you now got the seller and the buyer agreeing. They felt that was a fair deal because they, they agreed. So that basically create a basis for your business. Um, but what the challenge is, Richard, is a lot of times what we see is that what some of these early stage companies are selling is not necessarily common stock. They're selling a very preferential type of, you know, security that, you know, put the, in this case, the investor in a very advantageous situation where they get their money back before anybody else. So that's preferential. We call it liquidation rights. They also entice investors to buy that by also adding warrants and options and all kinds of stuff. So it gets a little complex to trying to figure out what they really gave up. We know what they got in cash. Hey, we, we got $10 million, but we thought we gave 10%. Well, you didn't really give 10%. You gave preferential, you gave warrants, you gave all these other factors. When you really do all the exercise, they're way ahead of the 10%. So it's trying to understand what they're giving. and. You know, a lot of times we tell our clients, like, yeah, let us help us some, help you with, with some of these discussions because you got to understand what you're giving up on these transactions. Just because you thought that these preferential units with all these warrants and options and everything else that you include into it was going to be 10%, that didn't really turn out to be 10%. It's a lot more. So something very important to, to take into consideration. But, yeah, once you do that, that creates the basis for you, your value, and um, we calibrate, you know, and – going into the future and new rounds of finance will bring more calibrations into the valuation. Got it. Got it, Gus. So Gus, one thing I've always struggled with is because you mentioned the income approach um, to entrepreneurs and maybe non-financial folks is a discount rate or the rate of return. Just in a very simple way, uh, Gus, how would you explain the fact that you were discounting the present value we're using some type of discount to the non-financial person? What does that mean? Oh, I wanted to get all technical. I got all excited when you say discount rate. I was going to talk about the CAPM, which is the capital <laughs> asset pricing model and the betas and all that. But yes. all right, so I get, I get very, um, very high level. So all it is is the, the rate of return that people will require to invest in your business. So if you start looking at from the perspective of I have $100 and if I put it into the treasury bills of the United States, how much am I getting back? That's the what we call the risk-free rate, right? Yes. Okay, I'm getting back 4%. Great. That's debt, and that's what we consider to be a risk-free rate because they're going to give it to you, plus the hopefully the U.S. doesn't default, you get your money. Um, then what is the next level? Well, let's get into equity. 
So the S&P, so what do you typically expect the S&P, you know, the companies in the S&P to give you in an annual basis above and beyond what the treasury bonds are giving you. So let's say it's an extra five to 6%. So now you're close to nine to 10%. Well, I can get nine to 10% if I put in the stock market. So what else is next? Okay, well, then the industry you operate. So there's all these factors, you know, am I, am I buying something in the United States or abroad, you know, South America or is Africa, or some other countries or some other, you know, places outside the United States that incorporate what we call country specific risk. And then on top of that, you get into, you know, a dimension of the industry, but then you get into the size of the investment. Like am I invested in a small company, what we call micro cap or in a large cap? So all those factors are adding up and then you get to what we consider to be the rate of return that you need to get in order to uh, invest up. So it's how much risk am I willing to take for those returns? So if you say, I'll give you, you know, X many dollars and you invest in this company that have a 50% chance of going bailey up, well, I better get a pretty good return on investment for that because it's highly risk, right? You're telling me it's 50% chance that this thing is not gonna be around. Am I gonna lose my money? So I'm not willing to give you my money for a 20% return on investment for something that I might lose everything and it's 50% chance of that. So once you understand those risk factors, then you come up with that rate of return that will entice investors to put money in. And that's why a lot of times, you know, early stage companies, unfortunately, the only way for them to raise money is gonna be at a very high rate of return and it's very, very challenging. No bank will lend them money because, you know, the banks are now there to lend money at a 40, 50, 60 percent return on investment. That's not their business. They don't want to take over the, you know, the, the companies. So you're going to have to go to unconventional investors. And those investors can get very sophisticated and they'll like to get a mix in between, you know, I get you a convertible note. So it is dead, but it's convertible. So if things are well, I get the best of both worlds, right? I convert it, I get equity. If things goes down, I get my money before anybody else get the money because it's debt. And if not, you know, I'll get the assets because I'm the one that, you know, the creditor. So it gets very challenging, unfortunately, for, you know, um, early stage companies, but that's, that's typically how it operates. And that's how the rate of, rate of return or, or what we call the discount rate is calculated. Got it. Okay. Gus, give me one minute here. Let me put you on sure. pause for a minute. Okay. Let me yes. put you on. All right. So Gus, we're at a dinner party, all right? And as you mentioned, we got some napkin math going on. So what is a quick way to value a business? I mean, people talk about EBITDA multiples, right? So tell me a little bit about that methodology, how accurate it is, you know, is it like, a, is it similar to a PE ratio? Just go a little bit more about the multiple of EBITDA because that's what most entrepreneurs will go to and have their napkin math on that basis, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, you're right. And and then we hear that a lot, Richard. I mean, that's typically what you're going to hear also from even investment bankers, brokers. I mean, everybody talks about EBITDA um, multiples. But again, and I'll, I'll get into the details, but the EBITDA multiples, sometimes we even show, we will utilize EBITDA multiples from market approaches that I mentioned, how we calculate those market approach you know, data. But when we even do evaluation based on the income approach, and let's say we use a discount of cash flow method, We'll come up with the value of that business and then we'll go ahead and calculate what we call the imply EBITDA multiple. We didn't start it with EBITDA multiple. We just value the business under yep. that discount of cash flow. And then let's say I'm coming up with a number that is, and I'm making this number up, it says $20 million. And the EBITDA was, let's say, five. Well, the implied multiple was four. And so then we'll talk with people like, so people it's easier for them a lot of a lot of you know people it's easier to understand and say well we're saying your business is worth four times that EBITDA which is what we call the operating income right because it's, it's your earnings on a cash basis before you know interest and before depreciation amortization and taxes so yeah. so when you look at it what we're trying to say is it will take you four years to get your money back yeah if you make that same number so that sinks a lot easier to people in people's heads because you you look at it and say, okay, if I'm going to put $20 million in this business and this business is going to give me $5 million a year, assuming they don't grow, there's no change and it's very stable. Um, so I'm going to have to wait four years to get my $20 million back. And then from there on, that's my money. I start, you know, finally get a return on investment. So I'm pretty much running a pretty, you know, running the risk in the first four years. And then after that, I get my money. 
so that's kind of the way people see it sometimes. And, and you know, um, the reason why they use EBITDA is because it's already taken into consideration some of the costs, right? The operating costs, the cost of goods sold, and everything else. Um, you know, so some other companies will be, people will be talking about multiples of revenues, like, you yeah. know, SaaS and technology companies, because that's, you know, primarily once you develop the technology, pretty much every dollar that get into revenue falls into the bottom line almost. And so they'll be looking into recurring, what we call recurring, you know, um, recurring revenue and then multiples of, of revenue. But again, it goes back to trying to understand how long it will take me on my payback, you know, how long it will take to get my money back. What am I investing? You know, and even when you look at public and traded companies, that's how people look into it sometimes. The the P is is the similar, very similar to the EBITDA. It's just that when you do a price to earnings multiple, um, the way I look at it, sometimes you're looking at it from a minority investor. Because you you're looking at the, you know, the overall equity, where the EBITDA is before interest, which is very important. So that means Debt is not is basically you kind of indirectly saying and excluding debt is part of you know you can have a debt free or you can leverage it. This is going to be on you. You got control. You can leverage this transaction or not. The overall company will generate four million. So if you want to buy for twenty, you can borrow ten if you want, and then give me ten. You get the bank to give you ten. You give me ten. You'll pay the interest. That's your capital structure. Where the PE is after interest, so it's more than the minority point of view, and that's why. When you look at public traded companies and you talk about the stock market and you see the news, they primarily talk about price to earnings versus EBITDA models. Got it, got it. And um, on the revenue basis, tell us about what scenarios that you would use a multiple of revenue, Gus. Yeah, like I mentioned, you know, like primarily we see it a lot with, you know, technology, um, software, you know, SaaS companies. And so, you know, we'll have, we we'll have companies that, you know, they they come up with like even subscription based companies. It doesn't need to be a, you know, a, a what I call a, a technology company. It could be subscription based where you have these number of subscribers and it could be a magazine. It could be a database. It could be, you know, some of the subscriptions that we use that we pay monthly, annually, whatever. And so a lot of times they're going to be valuing these based on those subscriptions, you know, how many subscriptions you have. Um, the cost of the subscription sometimes, you know, they're already embedded into the exercise, but somebody buying these are going to be looking into, you know, some of this revenue stream and they might already have, you know, what we call the infrastructure, the cost is already there. So they can just buy the subscription and absorb that with minimum cost. And so they'll, they'll look into paying, you know, well, companies will be looking into selling based on those revenue models. It's more important than sometimes the EBITDA, uh, cause the, the cost structure, you can work around that. And there's a lot of these companies as well. They're just still developing the technology. All the technology is just recently developed. And, you know, they are not necessarily being positive cash flows, right? So they're yeah. still showing negative EBITDA. That doesn't mean the company is worthless just because you don't have a positive EBITDA. You, you went through the process of investing a significant amount of time and money into developing something that now is paying off in the form of these recurrent revenue. And so now you have, a huge increase. You can have a company selling 60, $100 million worth of revenue, but negative EBITDA. that. And then you say, well, guess what? Next year I'm done. I finally developed, I stabilize. All I need to do is just stay on top of this technology, keep upgrading it. There will be some expenses to that. But the development phase of that is passed, which is a big chunk of cost associated with your operating expenses. And then you start seeing a lot of cash flows going through. But before you get there, those companies will be selling based on those, you know, multiples of revenues. Got it. Wonderful. Thank you for clearing it up, Gus. That that's important. So, Gus, on the example of EBITDA before interest and PE ratios, potential or net income after interest, you know, at, at you know dinner parties, people throw around enterprise value. Talk to me a little bit about the definition of enterprise value and how that contextualizes between EBITDA and and net income potentially. You know. Yeah. So. And that's that's a good point, Richard. I mean, you know, a lot of times people talk about, you know, value and I'm trying to make this as simple as I can. So let's say I tell you I'll buy your house for a million dollars. Okay. That would be the equivalent of what we call enterprise value. Yes. If I say I buy the equity in your house for ten thousand dollars, like the same house, exactly the same house, and I say, Richard, I'll buy the equity in your house. It's ten thousand dollars. You're like, 
Okay, I'll sell it. People were like, hold on. You mean you say you're going to buy the house for a million? Now you're saying you can buy it for 10000 Well, guess what? The house had $990,000 worth of debt. Yes. So that's equity. So the enterprise is basically what we call debt plus equity, right? So the value of the house right now, my house could be worth whatever I wanted, you know, whatever the market says it is. But nobody knows what is my debt on it. Exactly. So that, yeah, the total value of the company minus the debt is the equity. But the company plus the, or the equity plus the debt is the, what we call the enterprise. We add, you know, for purposes of valuation, we add the cash as well because people don't sell cash. So we kind of normalize working capital without getting too fancy on working capital. But the way I look working capital is more like a, you know, the gas that you have in your car. So I'll tell clients that, well, you sell your company. Think about selling a car. Do you sell your car with or without gas? Well, you sell without gas, that's going to be a problem. They're going to be able to take it off. It was the same as working capital. You're going to just take all the receivables, take all the cash, take all the inventory and leave the company empty. Now, you can negotiate it. You can structure in a way that says, I'm going to pay base of, you know, zero working capital. Fine, but then the price is going to drop. But typically the expectation is working capital will be reasonable to continue operating the business. I'm not going to also build up hundreds of millions and millions of dollars in inventory to a point where it's not even making any sense and then sell it like that because then you're leaving money on the table too. That's excess. And it's like selling your car with its three containers of gas. You know, you have the tank full, with a trailer full of gas and everything else. So that's my analogy, sometimes analogy of, you know, how I explain my working capital and 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 the value of a, a business, you know, when it comes to, you know, understanding those factors. But the, that enterprise value, equity value and working capital, those are really important factors that you need to consider. And then cash, as I said before, people, it's not the business of buying a business with just tons of cash. You know, sometimes I tell people like, while you're sitting on all this cash, you know, millions of dollars in cash in your company balance sheet, the buyer's not going to buy that. It's just that sometimes they just feel like, hey, we just invest through my company and just leave the cash in the company just in case people like to have it. Well, that's fine. But even though my valuation will inc include that cash, when we if we assume a scenario of selling your business, you got to assume that the company, the buyer is not buying the cash. But nobody paid cash for cash. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. I think we've done it. You've done a great job at covering the science now. Let's get into some of the practical aspects now. So in terms of key metrics, Gus, what key financial metrics should founders and executives focus on when assessing the value of their business? Yeah, and that's that's good. I mean, there, there, there are a lot. You did mention it that, right? And so, you know, operating income is critical. Um, I'll, you know, one of the one of the main metrics, I mean, you want to establish, you know, um, a company that people look into it and it depends, you know, they, there's a lot of different, you know, people look at a lot of different things. You know, you, you can look at more of a stable, very stabilized, you know, low growth company um, with, you know, maybe it's very mature um, that generates, you know, very recurring earnings and that's fine. Um, somebody might be more interested in a high growth company, right? With a high, you know, growth rates, a lot more risk potentially and so on. So, but you got to look at all those factors. So the, the value of a business is really going to be almost 100% correlated to the growth of that business. Yeah. You know, you got to be looking at growth. Um, you're going to be looking at, you know, the capacity of that business to generate cash flows. That's key too. You know, if we don't generate cash flows, when are we going to generate it? And if we can never generate cash flows, it's going to be tough to, to get business out of, to get money out of this company. Um, maybe you got a buyer that say, I know how to do it. And then, you know, buy it out. Just like you have Facebook and some of these, you know, companies that before they end up going public, you know, they were trying to figure out how we're going to, how we're going to, you know, get money out of these great, you know, ideas that we have. So you have to monetize that, you know, through advertising. How, how do you do it? And And so I think metrics related to, you know, growth is important. Metrics related to cash flows is important margins the margin of a company is, is very critical because it tells you how do you utilize your resources if for every dollar that you utilize you only you know get two percent return on investment that's not going to be very attractive i mean the idea is that you utilize your resources which are your assets and get very high return on investments which means hopefully for every two that million dollars in, in sales you can hopefully keep a big margin on those, which is a big differentiator. 
to do that, you have to be either a pioneer, you have to be, you know, those type of companies that, you know, are in the in the edge of development or coming up with great ideas. If you're going to be more of a follower, your margins are going to be always depressed, right? So those things are going to be important. And looking into the balance sheet, you also want to be able to, you know, have a solid balance sheet. I mean, having debt is not bad. Having debt is, is actually very helpful because debt is cheaper than equity. So yeah. debt is important. We did talk about cost of capital. So, you know, return on investment. So if you can finance your, your growth by using debt, which is a lot cheaper than equity, that's very, very important. But if you have too much debt, then that debt start becoming almost equity and it becomes very risky. And so, you know, how leveraged are you? Um, how are you using your resources? What type of assets you have? You know, the turnover ratios are key. We did talk about working capital. Am I going to be willing to buy a company? They say two got two same exact companies, but one somehow doesn't turn over the receivables. They give a lot of credit to the clients and the clients pay every six months, which is no good. The other one gets paid every month. You also have inventory that is over, you know, above and beyond what you typically need. You turn in, you turn your inventory every twice a year. The other one turns every 15 days. Well, I can say that this one is a lot more efficient. That turns everything a lot faster. It's going to need a lot less working capital, which means when it comes to the cost of debt, it's going to be less. And they're going to be able to, you know, generate a lot more cash flows than the other one that is not being efficient. So turnover ratios are key. Um, leverage is key. Um, margins are key. Growth is key. So I'm sorry, I couldn't just give you one, but it's just all these factors are being you know, consider when we do a business valuation. 100%. No, it's very well summarized, Gus. Um, I would, um, I would, I would, you know, add on to what you see, what you said there, you know, clearly in terms of growth, is revenue growing, are your profit yeah. growing, are your profit margins growing, is your cash flow growing? And you mentioned a very good point about, you know, uh, uh, is your return on assets potentially growing as well, whether it's, you know, yeah. your return on, you know, your working capital or even on fixed assets and so forth. And then the last point I would say, which is when I've kind of mentored businesses as well, Gus, is how are you relative to the competition? That's right. Where are your profit margins relative to competition? Where's your return on assets? So those are the kind of areas. Those are the, you've actually just summarized the Wall Street secrets there, Gus, in mm -hmm. a, a few yeah. sentences. Well done. <laughs> That's yeah, how well, best to look at businesses. It is, yeah. And, and it's a challenge, right? I mean, so they, you know, when I talk to some of my clients, because we do a lot of consulting and clients think about, I want to sell my business, what it's worth. And then here's what we think it's worth. But, you know, you fix all these factors, maybe it's worth, going to be worth more. And they like that because they start working towards those goals. And then two, three, four years down the road, they eventually sell for a lot more and they're really appreciative. But um, it is a challenge, you know, it's a challenge because sometimes you look into it and say, well, I'm growing a lot. And I'm looking at my resources and my working capital and everything that I get to grow my revenue. But then when they look at that revenue growth segment that maybe 80% of the revenue is growing very fast, the margin of that 80% of the revenue is only 10%, where the margin of the other 20% is 40%. And so then you start questioning yourself. It's like, we don't want to grow for the hell of growing. We just need to make sure that we are going to be smart about growing. On how we, which line of businesses are we going to grow? And we got to concentrate on everything costs money. My resources, everything that I sell and the cash cycle. Because by the time you sell, you bought the inventory. If you have to convert inventory to finished good, that's a manufacturing process. That's going to take time. From there, you're going to sell it. And then when you sell it, it's going to be receivables. And then you finally get cash. So it takes forever. The cycles could go from, you know, just weeks to months. And so... If you can know, utilize those resources to get more return on investment in the form of margin, if I'm getting only 10% margin in one versus 20 in the other, or you don't look into those factors because you don't think it's important, you're missing big time and you're not going to be able to get the most value out of your business. So you have to restructure sometimes. And it's tough, you know, because people feel like I cannot give up my audit percentage. I'm not, giving, I'm not asking you to give it up. I'm just asking you to start the process of moving into the more profitable business segment because it looks like you have an advantage in the marketplace. You're being able to maybe do more than your competitors and that's where you need to focus. And once they start doing that process and they convert it and then the 80% of the one that makes a 20% margin, 
and the 20% makes only 10, they start noticing, wow, my business just changed. Absolutely, Gus. Gus, there is another technique that I've used, um, particularly with, you know, fast growing companies, but lifestyle, lifestyle type companies who would be interested in doing some type of exit in the future. And I've often said, and I know you have as well with your clients is, you know, if you, if you assume a multiple of, of 10 on EBITDA, but you went and spent not recklessly, but you went and spent maybe overspent a hundred thousand, you know, what valuation that means on the back end, 10 times that valuation, right? So whilst you should manage your costs, there are investments that pay off 10 times and it works both ways. But I've often had entrepreneurs who have, you know, wanted to have a lifestyle company, spent a lot of money, which really don't pay off anything. And when you show them a simple equation that, you know, your business today is probably a 10 multiple, I agree with it, but your 100,000 you just spent on the party or whatever has probably just cost you a million bucks in value. 10 times that. Yeah. The same, so, you know? Yeah, that's that's a good analogy. Yeah, Richard, and that's very important. Now, keep in mind that there is something that people call a um, QB, right? The QB, yes. which is quality yeah. earnings. So, a quality of earnings, typically what it means is it's not an audit because people get it confused and say, well, look, can't, people are asking me to do an audit for selling the company. So you don't need an audit because you don't need to follow US CAP per se. This is an exercise to normalize, to show in a performa basis what your business um, is doing in, in, in a cash flows basis, you know, for, from the perspective of EBITDA. And so what, what the professionals will do and what we will do is we'll adjust those items on your financial statements for what we call non-recurring issues, like, you know, could be something that we just got impacted here in Florida by hurricane, hurricane, and we got, you know, three months shut down and well, guess what? We don't, that shouldn't count because that's not something that we get to see quite often, even though in South Florida we used to, but lately we have been lucky and I'm from weird. Um, but, you know, we will adjust for that. Oh, you'll have a one-time big game, like, you know, PPP loan forgiveness. It's like showing up in your financial statement. Well, believe me, then we're going to pay you 10 times the EP that, you know, on the PPP loan forgiveness game that you have in your p &L. It's just not going to happen. So all that get cleaned up. The other thing that we, you know, look into it is just because of privately held companies and they're totally fine. You know, they there are situations where, hey, I'm the owner. My kids are working for me. And my wife and everybody, and that's fine. Everybody's providing services, and you can do that on the you know, US gap, and it's totally fine with your taxes, and it's fine as long as everybody does the work. But you know, eventually, if you have a new buyer and say, Well, guess what? I'm gonna buy you and I'm gonna put somebody else, and your salary used to be a million dollars, but we decided that for somebody else to do the same work that you're doing, maybe the salary should be five hundred thousand dollars. Guess what? There's a five hundred five hundred thousand dollars adjustment up in your and your earnings times ten, you got five million dollars. So we tell our clients every time, even though now it's getting a lot more custom than before, I think U.S. have changed it a little um, late because Europeans have been doing this for a long time, is they to do a quality earnings on the sales side. When you're selling your business, do a quality earnings. They ask me, why? My financials are audited. Why do I need it? I don't need to spend the money. Let the buyers do it and challenge me, and then we'll fight. Said no. First of all, don't you want to have the answers to the test before you take the test? That's that's the answer. We're gonna do it. You're gonna be tested by the buyer when they do the quality. So let's have it. Secondly, don't you want to also be able to show that if we do find an adjustment that moves up your value, you don't want to take that into consideration now? Because the buyer, if they do find an adjustment to the EBITDA that should be moving up. They'll say, you know what? We agree with your number. Let's move on. They're not going to tell you that. They might not make an adjustment and say, and you might be like, oh my God, great deal. I closed my business at the price that I wanted to. Well, maybe you didn't notice, but the buyer found an extra million dollars in your earnings that he's not going to pay you 10 times that. So, you know, we do recommend clients to basically go through that process. I know it's not easy, but it's important. And, you know, again, this is a, you know, life's changing event. I mean, it's important to take into consideration any, when you're selling a business, I mean, this could be your biggest investment that you have. And this you maybe might be the only time you're ever going through this. So yeah, it is costly, but it goes back to return on investment. If you do this correctly, you might find situations where, yeah, I found 
you know, adjustments that will forget about the cost that I put into doing this exercise. It just adds back into the value of my company significantly. And just being able to bring credibility to the table. Because when you do this and you're trying to sell your business and you haven't done the exercise and then they start going through all the adjustments and they got to 700 adjustments, you lose a lot of credibility as well from the accounting perspective. So it's just something that, you know, everybody got to think into it. Absolutely. No, that's great advice, Gus. Great advice. All right. What are some of the common challenges and misconceptions that entrepreneurs face when trying to value their business, Gus? Um, again, the, the challenges that we see is like, it's just to oversimplify this, right? Sometimes they just hear, you know, my competitors all seven times, maybe that. They don't have a clue what was in there. I can tell you that maybe two out of five transactions include an earn out. Uh, most of these transactions will have a complex capital structure, which means you'll have, you know, potentially earn out. You have options, ones, convertible debt, preferred stocks, common stocks. You got all these different things. So when somebody says a seven time maybe that is really oversimplifying. It may, maybe it wasn't that seven time maybe that. Because you know they forgot the fact that it was an earn out there too. Yeah. They forgot about the fact that the seller um rollover equity common, but the buyer end up getting all the preferential, you know, what we call preferred stock, which is worth a lot more one to one. So that for me is the 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 most likely scenario where people oversimplify and they look at you know some of these transactions and make mistakes um and i'll say that most of the funds pe funds and family offices and so on you know they're very sophisticated they they're going to make sure that whatever investments they make that they're going to be the first one getting the money back yep and so it's not going to be when you are when you're being asked to roll over shares you want common stock is not going to be equal in value to one preferred stock. So you got to understand those factors and, and really, you know, do your homework. I mean, you know, don't, don't just buy into what you're listening out there and hearing from people, just do your homework and trying to, you know, be the one that basically create the value and say, Hey, yeah, I know how my company was sold and here's what the deal is, but don't rely on other transactions just by, you know, word of mouth and, you know, trying to come up with that and say, well, Here's what I think I'm going to sell my company. I'm going to buy somebody else. It's just, it just does shortcut some payoff. Got it. Got it. So we've talked a lot about the opportunities to potentially improve valuation, Gus. Let's talk a little bit about risk management now. So from a valuation perspective, Gus, how does effective risk management contribute to a business perceived value? A, a lot. You know, again, goes back to risk and return, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you have a company that doesn't have any procedures and any protocols to to manage risk and, you know, things can get out of hand very quick and very easily, you know, through lawsuits, through malpractice, you name it. If you don't have those protocols, I mean, it's going to make your business a lot riskier. You know, talk about cybersecurity. There's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on right now. So, you know, risk management will help you a lot to mitigate any of those issues. And also, you know, even though it costs money, I get it. It's like, how can I increase the value of my business by spending money on all these, you know, mitigation factors, you know, mitigating and doing all these risk management issues in my company? Um, well, it does increase the value of business by doing so because, again, it brings a lot more stability on what we consider to be, you know, your cash flows going forward. Because the worst scenario, hopefully, is not going to be as bad as, you know, what would you see in another company that doesn't have some of these risk management situations. Got it. And so, so Gus, just to bring this point home, you've seen many businesses, they've probably, you know, been on a nice trajectory, nice valuation, getting ready to sell a business, maybe, you know, a year or two out, or maybe even less period of time. Then suddenly something happens. And something tanks. Is there any particular story without obviously showing a name or whatever that you've come across that if they had paid more attention to the risk factors in their business, because that's part of your valuation technique, there's a risk premium and so on, right? That's factored into the valuation of business, that they could have, you know, offset a significant valuation decline because of some risk factor. Uh, yeah. 
I've, I've seen a lot of those, Rich. I mean, yes. you know, you'll be surprised because again, we do valuations in a, you know, we, we sometimes assist, we have clients that we've been helping for the last 20 years. And so we yes. will see in the trend. So I, I brought up cybersecurity because that, that's one of those factors, right? So some some of our clients have been impacted, you know, some, you know, there's, there's people when all these first started many years ago, you know, there's situations where, you know, cyber was a major issue. We do have a cybersecurity in our firm. You know, we we have a team that specializes in providing those services to our clients. But, you know, before, you know, it was almost a a must because now it's a must, right? But before when all these started happening, you know, you would be hit by one of these cyber, you know, threats. I mean, it's just not only about the fact that it's going to disrupt your business, but the credibility that you have in the marketplace and your clients. So you can create a lot of negative goodwill. Um, you know, other examples are related to key employees, you know. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, you, yeah, you rely heavily on, you know, a few key employees of the firm. Um, and unfortunately, things happen. You know, some of these employees leave the firm or, you know, they could get sick or something would have happened. And now you don't have a plan B. Now you have, you know, you're pretty much scrambling, trying to, you know, find a replacement that, you know, it's going to be hard to find because that's a key employee. That's the, maybe the employee that either have all the client relationship or the employee that has, you know, the know-how, knowledge. So, you know, having an understanding of, of those factors are going to be very, very critical. Understood. What about concentration of your business? Yeah. I've seen I mean, that time and time again, right? You know, one product, one market, and then something happens in the macro environment and all of a sudden... Things go a bit haywire. Talk a little bit more about that particular instance. Yeah. I mean, diversification is key, right? So, you know, it could be in markets, it could be in products, it could be in customers. I mean, you can have, you know, some of these, you know, clients that sell primarily to the big box, you know, and heavily relying on Walmart. And so Walmart is 95% of my revenues. Well, they shut you down in one country, you're pretty much done. And so um, it, it is really critical. I mean, it's like what you're saying, I mean, being, you know, diversified. So when, when you look at a business, and you're trying to find, you know, what the value of these businesses is. You can crunch numbers. You can do as much as you can. You got, I mentioned all these methodologies. So there's all these, what we call quantitative exercises. Right? It's all quantitative numbers, crunching and everything. But there's a lot of qualitative need as well that you need to go through. And that goes into you know, concentration on, on your customer base, you know, industry, product. And so... You know, you're 100% relying on one product and that product become obsolete. You're out of your market. I mean, that's it. And so, you know, you just got to think always way ahead of the game. You know, think about, I got it. This is a great product, but never be satisfied. Don't stop. Because the day you stop, you know, that's when your competitors are going to be moving ahead. So you got to always be moving forward, um, you know, finding the next, the next solution. You know, what is out there? Um, and just trying to be a pioneer in the industry. So, you know, trying to move on and, and like to your point, diversify is clear. Understood. All right. Strategic considerations, and this could be organic or M&A. So what long-term strategies, Gus, can the executives adopt to consistently create and enhance the value of their business? Yeah, I mean, again, it's that's a, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's pretty wide, but there's a lot of, you know, from the strategic point of view, each industry, each company will have their own strategic, right? So, and that's what's going to dictate, you know, their success. If you go down the path with the wrong strategy, you're not going to be in business too long. Um, but you got to be quick. You got to be able to adapt. You know, if you think about what happened to Amazon, I mean, Amazon wasn't where they are today. You know, many years ago, they were selling business, they were selling books, right? And so, they, they were in the business of selling books. And what did they do? They were able to adapt very quick. So I think being able to adapt is the key, um, you know, staying on top of what is going on um, in, in the industry and what is going on, not just on the industry, but in the world, what is happening out there um, and trying to stay one step ahead of your competitor is going to be always great. You, know, you got to invest, you got to invest on, you know, um, technology, you got to, you got to invest on, you know, and what you're doing to so that when you move forward, you have what you need to get there. Um, and strategically, you can look into, for example, you just mentioned, you know, trying to diversify into new markets, maybe through an acquisition, you know, trying to diversify into, you know, a new product or service. You can do that through acquisition. You know, you can vert vertically integrate um, and figure out if that works for you. 
I know way back in, in the days, you know, that was like, you know, the way to do it. I know GM, sorry, GE was one of those companies, was, you know, integrating so many things that eventually decided like that's not working out anymore, right? And they have to divest. And we see it a lot. So there's a lot of integration. You get too deep into too many things. And now you're too diversified that you lose focus on what you're supposed to do. Or you're too narrow that's too risky. So you got to be careful. You got to balance. You cannot get too wide. But you cannot be too narrow. And when I, when they ask me, well, what is too wide, too narrow? Where should I be? Well, that's that's something you need to do or need to know as a management, as a CEO, as a, you know, the person running this show. You need to know where you need to go. Because uh, once you dictate the directions you're taking, again, you're utilizing those resources th into this into that direction. And you want to generate return on investment in those resources. If that return on investment is not there, you took the wrong path and it's going to cost you. Got it. It's going to cost you a lot. Got it. So, Gus, there's a lot of conversation around what's the purpose of a, of a company, purpose of a business, right? Um, you know, the old definition was, you know, increasing, you know, shareholder value. Now it's become much more broader, other stakeholders and so forth, right? That's a conversation for another day. But let's assume now that one of them is increasing stakeholder value or shareholder value, right? Uh, and let's talk about communication. So how can executives effectively communicate the value proposition of their business to stakeholders, including the board? And I'm talking about, you know, we're making investments, we continue to improve the valuation of the business. How have you seen or how can executives all the way up to the board do a better job of communicating how value is in, in, improving in the business? Yeah, well, if you hear some of those Wall Street calls, right, for some of those public traded companies, they do it every quarter. Yes, And you'll see how the market reacts. If they don't like what they're hearing, because they're the stakeholders and the shareholders, what's going to happen to the stock? It's going to tank. And so they like to hear and they want to know what is coming next. So, you know, if Apple is sitting in a lot of cash and they're not utilizing that, you better find a way to do something with that cash or sending it back to your shareholders. So it goes back to how do you utilize the resources and, and what type of return on investment you're going to give me as an investor, as a shareholder, the board, whatever. And so you got to be able to explain your strategy in a way that shows how those resources are going to be utilized and that they're going to create the maximum return on investment that you can get out of those resources. And so that's the, really the key. Now, is that simple? No, it's very challenging. You know, it's really difficult to continue growing year over year, over year, because you got your competitors right behind you. And then you're going to be not only competing to this same group of companies that do the same that you're doing, but once you start expanding, then you're getting into other industries and other competitors. And if you're the leading, people believe me are going to be going after you. So you got to be innovating in a daily basis. And it is a challenge, but you got to find the right people. I will say, from the strategic point of view, I always say you want to be surrounded with people that are smarter than you are. You got to find the right people that share your vision and understand, you know, the direction of, of the company, the direction you want to take, and then just really go, you know, full speed on it. Do what you can to get to where you need to be at, but just be smart about it, you know, and, and it's just... You know, that's the $1 million question, because if everybody would know how to do it, then we would have a lot of different, you know, you know, Apples and Amazons and, you know, Fortune 500 companies out there. It's just, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. And, you know, nobody has that secret sauce. We, we know how together, but the challenge is, you know, what to do together, right? And so it's just, again, being smart about your resources. Every penny that you invest in your company Think about how that's going to improve your operations and what it's going to do to your business. Every dollar. Am I doing something to my accounting system? Is that going to help me? Do I need to do it? Is that how good? Am I investing in new equipment and machinery? Am I, you know, hiring new, you know, cell team? Am I investing in how is what am I don't just use the resources for the hell do don't just go for money. Just think about how that's going to be deployed in your business and what it's going to be the return on investment. So every project that you do, you should be able to somehow come up with a return on investment. And you've come all the way full circle from the beginning of this conversation. Return on investment. Well yeah. Every dollar that you put into your company, how is that going to 
what is the return on investment? Put it this way, Richard. I mean, if, if my cost of capital, the cost of my shareholders asked for my business based on my risk, and that's we call it the WAC, weighted average cost of capital. Let's say the cost of investment that my, you know, the cost of equity for my investor is let's say 20%. And then the bank is lending me a 10. And now we got 50 debt, 50 equity. So 20, 10 is 30 divided by two is 15%. That's my cost of capital. Now I was able to get $10 million and I'm going to deploy. You better deploy in a project that's going to generate more than 15%. Absolutely. If you're generating something that's less than, than that, then you, you're making the company worth less. Yeah. You're destroying shareholder value. Absolutely. So, yeah. So every project has got to be analyzed and very carefully. I'm not saying that every penny, but you just got to make sure that you understand how you're deploying your capital and understand what type of return investment you're getting out of it. Absolutely. This is awesome, Gus. Final stretch, last couple of questions or so. Um, what is the advantage of, of obtaining an independent valuation, Gus? Hey, it's like going to the doctor, right? So, you know, get somebody to check you out and just tell you the truth. I mean, that's the key. I mean, just get somebody to be objective. Just tell them, you know, if you're looking for somebody to agree with your numbers just because you got the ego, that's not going to help you. You're not going nowhere. You're just going to pay for somebody to say what you want to say, and it's just you're going to lose that money. Just get somebody to be objective, tell you, you know, what they really think their number is, and if you disagree, then let's go into have discussions about you know why, because nobody likes to hear bad news. And if it's a good news, then great. But you, know, you just gotta you gotta listen, you gotta learn. You're paying a professional to do that work, and then see what it is. Now you might also need it for compliance purposes. You know, without valuation, you might not be able to get your audit financial statements, or you might not be able to get some tax work done. I mean, there's compliance around that. But more on the consulting, if you need to spend the money from the consulting perspective, hey. This is a good opportunity to to listen and, and find ways to improve the value of your business. Absolutely. Okay. What common mistakes are made when valuing a business? Uh, you did mention, you know, the enterprise value versus equity. I mean, I've seen so many times people applying a multiple EBITDA saying, you know, my business is worth four times EBITDA. Well, the EBITDA was five million. Now, you know, we're twenty million dollar business is worth. And so I'm taking home 20 million. Yeah, you forgot you got $15 million loan to Bank of America. Right. Exactly. Not taking 20 million, you're taking 5 million back home. You got to pay your debt. So, you know, I hear that quite often. It's just, um, um, you know, that happens. But yeah, there's a lot of oversimplifying. Oversimplifying also um, kills that. And I think underestimating also the qualitative factors that we talk about. You know, yeah. a lot of times everybody just look at, the number is crunch the number, forget about key man, you know, key employee, you know, concentration of customers, concentration of products, you know, lack of know-how. I mean, there's a lot of different succession plan. There's too many things that needs to be understood. So if you take a shortcut because you just want to get somebody to do a quick and dirty evaluation, you know, based on, you know, something very high level, I mean, you you get what you pay for a lot of times. Got it. Last question, Gus. What is your parting advice when valuing a business? Um, I'll say again, it goes back to that return on investment, right? I mean, you know, just just make sure you understand from that perspective. It gotta make sense. It's just gotta make sense. You know, if it's gonna take me two hundred years to get my money back, I, I don't think this is the right business value. You know, I just don't think anybody will in the mind in the right mind is gonna pay that much money. Um, so it's just gotta make sense. Things gotta. Sometimes it makes sense and you got to you got to follow common sense. That's that's the key. Got it. Gus, this was tremendous to you as the national lead at Cherry Becker. You'll do a great job to you and the team. This has been a fantastic session. What wonderful wisdom bites. I know we compressed a lot in um in an hour or so together. Oh, but this is just tremendous. And this is usually at the forefront of the entrepreneurs minds or all the way up to the board. It's at some point uh, realizing the value of this business, either in the public markets or the private ones or PE firms. Um, and so you've got, you've unpacked a lot here, Gus, and I really appreciate it. This is tremendously valuable to the audience, I'm sure. I appreciate it, Richard, and it's a pleasure to be on your program. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Gus. Great job. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.